welcome to this Data Europa Academy webinar. So my name is uh, Flora Copello and I work for the Publications Office of the EU at datageuropa.eu, the official portal for European data. Uh, this is the last webinar in a series uh, focusing on the Open Data Maturity Report 2022 and its respective dimensions. So for those that are joining um, for the first time uh, for this series, the Open Data Maturity Report provides an overview of the efforts of more than 30 countries and is used to measure the level of maturity of countries in the European Union and, and abroad and to highlight progress in promoting uh, open data publication and reuse. So the report aims to serve two purposes, inspiring national open data teams and individuals interested in fostering open data availability and reuse, and tracking the progress on um, how countries move towards open data. So the report measures and compares progress over the years across four dimensions, quality, portal, policy, and impact. Following the publication of uh, the Open Data Maturity Report in the end of 2022, here in Data Europe Academy, we decided to organize this series of webinars to share with you insights and main takeaways of this study and present the best practices from the participating countries, focusing in its webinar on a different dimension. So the first session uh, provided an overview of the Open Data Maturity Report 2022 and included an interactive session to build participants' uh, understanding. The second webinar focused on the quality dimension with representatives from Slovenia and Ukraine sharing the best practices. Third webinar was on the portal dimension with France and Poland sharing uh, insights from their respective open data portals. And the fourth webinar uh, considered the policy dimension where Estonia and Italy shared their open data policies and strategies. Today's webinar, the fifth one and final one, will highlight the impact dimension. We will have two countries, uh, Czech Republic and Sweden, that will share with us their willingness and ability to measure both the reuse and impact uh, created through the reuse of open uh, data. And uh, before we move to today's uh, agenda and uh, introducing our speakers, I would like to take uh, a moment to share the rules of today's uh, webinar, which are common for every Data Europa Academy webinar. So the webinar will be recorded and uh, the recording and presentation will be shared to you. So no worries if you have missed something, we will, you will receive the recording and uh, the presentation in the upcoming days. It will be also uploaded to Data Europa Academy. Please also allow three minutes after the webinar to share with us uh, our feed, uh, your feedback, to answer our survey. Your feedback is very important for us, so it will help us to further improve the content we are sharing with you. So at the end of the session, you can scan the QR code that we will share, and we will also share the link uh, to uh, have an ac direct access to the survey. And for any questions you might have, I already see you familiarizing with, uh, with the chat. So please feel free to use it and we will make sure to answer any questions throughout uh, the webinar uh, or during the Q&A. So, as previously mentioned, today I'm not alone. Uh, I have the chance to have experts on the field of, of open data uh, that will share with us their best practices and their insights. Starting with Natalia Rosbrock, my colleague from the Publications Office of the EU and one of the main responsible behind the Open Data Maturity Report. So welcome, Natalia. We have uh, Lenka Kovasova. Uh, Lenka is an open data specialist at the Digital and Information Agency in the Czech Republic. She is responsible for the development of the national open data portal, connects open data users and publishers and participates in working groups focus on digitization and open data tasks. Happy to have you today, Lenka. And then we have also Josephine Lasinanti. Josephine works at the Swedish uh, Digitalization Agency as a specialist in open data and data-driven innovation and as a product owner for the Swedish data portal. Previously to that, she has also conducted research on the transformation towards open data with a particular focus on reuse and value created at the societal level. Happy to have you as well, Josephine. So as you can see, we have speakers with very impressive open data uh, oriented profiles and we're 
very much looking forward to all your interventions. Moving on now to today's agenda, and I'm promising this is the last slide, and then I will give directly the floor to our speakers. We have already had the short introduction. Uh, following this, Natalia will have 20 minutes to provide us with more information on the results and trends of the Open Data Maturity Report 2022, and particularly on the impact dimension. Then Lenka and Josephine uh, will have 25 minutes each to share their best practices for their respective uh, countries on the impact and the reuse of open data. And then we will close the webinar with a Q&A session, answering any questions you may have uh, for today's speakers. And uh, this is all from my side. And I will give now directly the, fro uh, the floor to Natalia. Thank you, Flora, so much for introduction. Can you hear me just to check the connection? Perfect, perfect. Mm -hmm. Yes, hello everybody, good morning. My name is in fact Natalia Rosbro. I'm working for Publications Office of the European Union for the data.europa.eu portal. If somebody still didn't visit our portal, I invite you warmly. It's a central official point of access to datasets of European countries. Um, at national, regional, and like local level, as well as data sets of your institutions. Today, I have, in fact, pleasure to introduce to you briefly the yearly Open Data Maturity Assessment Exercise. It's a tool uh, to assess maturity of member states and beyond in the open data uh, field. This uh, 20 to assessment exercise is the eighth edition. Uh, the open data maturity has been measured since 2015. It's annual benchmarking exercise result, resulting in fact in open data maturity report. It is a self-assessment exercise. The countries asked to reply question based on surveys um, with uh, four uh, dimensions of maturity. It's a very extensive questionnaire. The report is published yearly by Publications Office jointly with DigiConnect, uh, responsible for overall open data policy and legislation. The latest edition assesses uh, maturity in 35 uh, European countries, uh, including 27 uh, member states, of course, but also Iceland, Norway and Switzerland. And we have also four candidate countries, it's Albania, Montenegro, Serbia and Ukraine, and also Bosnia and Herzegovina. So the assessment, as Flora also mentioned, is um, measuring and is based on four indicators, its policy, its impact we are talking today, and its portal and equality. In 2022, we revised a slightly approach and questions. Uh, first, we wanted to include better uh, and represent better the region and local realities because we realized that sometimes there are differences at national level, but regions and um, are also very active and interesting to track. Uh, we are focusing more on the high value data sets. It's important uh, regulation now being in, in implementation phase by the member states. So we are starting to monitor also uh, this aspect. And in fact, we restructured quite heavily the impact dimension. We are going to talk about today. Um, but first, brief the results uh, of the 2022 um, assessment. Uh, so the overall um, open data maturity score for U27 uh, is 75% versus uh, 78 last year. Policy is the most mature uh, dimension, followed by portal, then quality and impact is the least um, mature dimension among four. France and Ukraine scored the most and are leading the way in 2022 exercise. We are clustering countries based on the maturity. It is uh, done to uh, enable countries uh, to learn from each other, uh, to see what are the trends maybe to follow. The clustering is done into uh, four categories, beginners, followers, fast trackers, and trendsetters. Um, 
I would like just to highlight this. This year, Belgium, Belgium, Czech Republic, Italy and Cyprus did the biggest progress, uh, each of them passing from one category to another. And in overall, we can say that countries uh, lie on the higher spectrum of the score above 65%. But now coming to the impact, before we uh, go to the impact assessment uh, methodology of ODM, of Open Data Maturity Report, let's set a little bit of the scene and start by thinking of the definition. It's not so easy. We, I think, all know that measuring impact is, in fact, the most challenging of all uh, dimensions. And um, there is also no universal definition of open data impact. But we can say that there is a consistent element of impact, uh, which is uh, that reusing open data brings value and is beneficial for society in general. So we are looking at how it generates this value. Open data can have an impact in diverse domains. Normally and usually is analyzed from economic, governmental, social and environmental perspective to demonstrate the value that reusing data can bring to society. I would like uh, also briefly to highlight um, a couple of other initiatives uh, which attempt to measure impact. So a part of the open data maturity assessment, which is uh, surely a very important tool and its annual exercise. Uh, we have also mm, conducted in 2020 a very extensive study and published a report on the economic value of open data uh, in European countries. Uh, the report uh, estimated open data market size in 2020 and gave some perspective on how the open data market size could develop uh, towards 2025. It looked um, at the different sectors uh, and at the employment of people working and in the open data field. It tried to quantify efficiency gains from open data like, for example, life saved, uh, environmental improvements uh, or possible cost savings. And a report also includes examples and insights into how open data is used by organizations. And I would like to highlight also one more initiative. Uh, it's um, another method, in fact, to uh, approach the impact measurement. Uh, it's called Use Case Observatory. It's also a study a report. Uh, we will have two more in the series and it is monitoring 30 reuse cases over three years to gain a holistic picture of how impact is created by exemplar open data reuse cases. So I invite you to look at these um, publications if you would like to dig deeper into impact topic in general. But now coming to the Open Data Maturity Impact Indicators, so it has its own methodology, of course. As I mentioned, it was revised in 2022, uh, and the aim of this revision for the impact dimension was to better distinguish between uh, measuring their use, which was done previously, focus on their use, and uh, against uh, measuring really created impact based on this reuse. It is not an easy task because measuring impact in this broad sense is very difficult. Uh, the revised impact dimension assesses several criteria grouped into three indicators. The first indicator is strategic awareness. Strategic awareness is all about uh, having definition, clear definition first of reuse and then of impact. Uh, also, we are looking at whether methodology exists at countries level uh, to measure the impact of open data and uh, if the monitoring takes place at national, regional and local level, um, for example, of impact by, um, for example, portals, including high value data sets monitoring. The second um, indicator is measuring reuse. So we are still in this field of reuse measuring. Um, we are looking at which activities exist in countries um, 
to measure uh, reuse of data sets and how the data sets are used. So this uh, encompasses, for example, whether countries analyze log files or have mechanism for automated feedback collection or conduct surveys and other research to understand how the data sets are used. But then uh, the measuring reuse has also uh, the better understanding of reusers uh, aspect. So this is about having a possibility to gather feedback directly from the users uh, via sessions, uh, online meetings, and so on. And also if um, a process is in place uh, to, systematically, to systematically gather these reuse cases and uh, classifying them as well. And uh, finally, the last uh, uh, indicator and the most <laughs> tricky one is a created impact. It's newly introduced uh, indicator this year. It evaluates uh, benefits generated by open data and its reuse on government, society, environment, and the economy. So we are looking both at existing data uh, at the countries level, uh, which could give a clue and numbers of what are the benefits uh, gained from uh, reuse of data, as well as a specific reuse cases, uh, examples, um, which are mapped to challenges included uh, into this indicator. In terms of governmental impact, we look at what examples exist that showcase the impact of open data on, for example, increasing government efficiency and effectiveness in delivering public service or enabling better policy. So these are the challenges. Uh, regarding societal impact, we again look at what uh, reuse examples exist to showcase impact of open data at, for example, uh, increasing awareness of housing issues or better including marginalized groups and reducing inequality and so on. Environmental impact, what reuse cases exist to um, showcase uh, impact of on open data uh, on, for example, raising awareness on climate change. And for economic impact, that are examples showcasing impact on employment or technology and innovation or business creation. The uh, results in brief for the impact dimension for this year, as I said, it's a least uh, mature dimension of open data maturity uh, assessment exercise. It has a score of 71% uh, um, for countries. Um, it is also uh, due to the fact, uh, so this lower score, uh, how we interpret it is due to the fact that first of all, the methodology was restructured. Secondly, the uh, impact is laying really at the end of the value chain. So after po policy portal and quality, it comes at the end. So it has also the biggest potential actually to grow. Uh, five countries, Cyprus, Czech Republic, who is today with us, Estonia, France, and Ireland uh, score maximum points for strategic awareness, measuring impact, and created impact. Congratulations. Uh, and they are closely followed by Spain, Poland, Italy, who score above 90%. Most of the countries uh, are laying with the score above 70%. So it is still very good. Mm -hmm. And now we can look a little bit more on what happens within each of the uh, dimensions. For strategic awareness, we can say that uh, legal frameworks are very important for the definition of reuse and impact. Uh, com community engagement as well uh, for the monitoring uh, of reuse. So for example, uh, France is actively involved in communities to monitor the impact. Data met met metrics are widely used, data metrics from the portals like logs and so on. Uh, there are sometimes specific tools developed to measure reuse, um, but also it is measured via surveys and yearly exercises. Countries prepare for measuring the high value data sets reuse. 
and in general conduct many initiatives in this regard. For the measuring reuse itself, um, we see that 81% uh, of the countries have activities in place to map which data sets are reused. Uh, also, many countries conduct interviews and workshops with reusers, 82%. There are already automated feedback mechanisms in place by 73% of the countries. 68% um, is conducting surveys and analyzing the log files to understand uh, the reuse of data sets. And some countries are mentioning uh, other methods of measuring data use, such as, for example, meeting nonprofit uh, organization or private companies uh, and showcasing reuse in this way. Uh, for the measuring reuse, it's important also to understand user needs. Um, it uh, regards regular feedback collection. It regards uh, statistics, surveys, webinars, hackathons, uh, and other um, methods. And finally, uh, collected uh, reuse cases. Uh, need to be classified. So about 70% of countries uh, have a systematic way um, and different approaches to um, classify these uh, results um, and uh, present them to public. Finally, uh, we are in the created impact insights. It is a very good uh, moment uh, where I will close and pass the floor to my colleagues because created uh, impact um, is um, based a lot on the concrete use cases. So uh, we see that the impact of open data is felt strongest in government at 73% uh, through improved transparency in government efficiency. The social domain uh, lays at 67%, also benefits from open data mainly through increased awareness on health and well-being. And economic impact is currently lowest, 58%. Um, uh, although we can say that data is already regularly used for, for innovation in new technologies. Um, for each of the challenges in uh, the um, governmental, uh, environmental, social, and uh, economic uh, impact uh, areas, there were multiple challenges. And to all of these challenges, countries submitted their use cases. Uh, it's a very rich library of the use cases, which I invite you also to go through. But I think that now we will actually exactly hear about them in detail. So that's where I pass the floor to my colleagues. And I'm also looking forward to see how you created impact with your use cases. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you. Uh, it was such an interesting uh, session, but as you said, it's so important now to see the actual use cases uh, on, on the impact. So there are already some questions uh, for you in the chat. You can address them now, otherwise we will take them on, on the Q&A session. And uh, now I will give the floor uh, to Lenka, a representative from Czech Republic. Lenka, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the possibility to participate in today's webinar. I think uh, maybe I'm going to answer to the questions in the chat also at the end of my presentation. Uh, but uh, I'm here today to share, I don't know if it's the best practice, uh, for sure it's a practice uh, from the open data impact and reuse measuring uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, I work at the Digital and Information Agency. We are quite a new central authority. It was established in April 2023, so it's something like a half a year. Maybe some of you may know that uh, Open Data Agenda was before the part of the activities of Ministry of Interior of the Czech Republic. So we were basically just transferred from one office uh, to another. But at the Digital Information Agency, we take care of cataloging and data sharing, not only open data, but data sharing in the Czech uh, public sector. 
and our national open data team that is basically a really fancy name for two fde uh, is, is working there and we take care of uh, national open data portal and the uh, national open data catalog of course that you can find in data.gov.cz uh, uh, how we measure uh, the impact. Uh, our approach, to be honest, it's uh, quite different from the approach uh, presented in the Open Data Maturity Report because uh, we have something uh, like a more comprehensive impact assessment. It's, uh, we have quite a waste methodology that is not really uh, easy to use, but uh, it's based on the basic premise that uh, open data does not manifest itself immediately as you can see and as you as you already know but only uh, indirectly to the use and often with the time lag we have different metrics uh, and every metric uh, has a different value and we are somehow calculating on how close we are to the ideal state and uh, or how far to be honest in in some of the categories the categories are working with the open government principle with the data quality metadata quality with the different uh, metrics for for providers or even how they take care of the uh, data inventory is not only the open data because uh, we think that the the quality and the evidence uh, of the of the data it's it's basically are very important for the for the quality of the open data at the end of the process and the collection uh, of the reuses of the reuse cases is only only part of the of the methodology but this part it's uh, from the part of the czech republic used uh, to answer the open data maturity index and especially the category of of the impact so when i'm going to uh, look closely to the different categories. So uh, I I decided to, to I, or I choose several examples from the different categories for the governmental impact. As the first example, I choose the, it's called Hlidač Smluv in Czech. It's something like contracts watchdog. It works, uh, it's, it's a portal web application that work with the open data from the register of contracts, but all the contracts from the public organization over some some amount of money have to be put on and uh, it's available in open data format and then it uses uh, the data about public procurement uh, it was created several years ago for the mostly for public control of state and local government politicians and companies and especially the relations between different politicians uh, state organization and uh, private companies but uh, actually, I choose this example because it's a very important tool for the public organization uh, themselves, because they can use it uh, uh, to compare common prices for provided services. So they can use this uh, before their own public procurement. Uh, so they can spend resources, public resources more efficiently. And the nice thing of the, of the application is that uh, it's actually looking for the errors in the contracts because uh, the law is telling us uh, to, to public and, uh, organization how the contracts should, uh, should look. And this application is looking for the errors. And we have the feedback from the public officials and even from the authors of the uh, application. Then after they put the contract in the register of contracts, they usually go to this contracts watchdog to check if they have the contracts correctly so they can uh, correct their own errors and uh, meet the formal requirements uh, for the public contracts so it's very useful and it's not used only for the control from the part of the uh, uh, from the part of the public uh, another portal is called uh, Map of uh, Execution. It was very, very important in the Czech society uh, several years ago because it basically opened the, the question of the execution as a phenomena, as a social phenomena in Czech Republic. It uses or it was based on the open data from the execution and the, by individual regions, districts and uh, municipalities. Uh, let's say that at that time, the quality of this data was scarce. It, it was really, really terrible. So it took quite a time to find out what's inside the data and what the data is talking about. But what is, what is really important, it's uh, this some kind of simple map visualization of the data of execution drew really a big attention of the media and the public uh, to the 
often illegal, let's say, activities of the chamber of bailiffs that is uh, officially responsible for, the, for taking care of execution in the Czech Republic. It led to the changes in the, in the law and uh, it uh, actually highlighted the uneven distribution of execution in the regions. And it was obvious that it's really, really related to the, of course, to the financial, economic and social situation in the, in the different regions. And it led to the activity called Summer of Grace, that is basically the debt forgiveness under certain conditions, of course, uh, from the part of public institutions towards the public. But it was really, as I already said, it was really important uh, for the law changing and for the, for the taking care of more of this phenomena as a, as a big problem in the Czech Republic. When I move to the uh, uh, next category, that is social impact, uh, I would also like to talk about, you, uh, about two uh, examples uh, of the reasons. Uh, the first one, it's called uh, Prazne domy or empty houses. It has nothing to do with Halloween, don't be scared. But it's it's really nice portal that is basically uh, not a social network, but it's, uh, it'll, it's some of profiles for these empty houses uh, where you can find, uh, you, maybe you can see it in the presentation, but uh, if, if the house is already occupied or not, where you can find a house, uh, there are photos or even the story of the houses and the reason why the house is empty. And the authors of the, of the portal decided to draw uh, attention to the long-term empty houses because they present uh, difficulties for their location, they attract social uh, negative social phenomena, and especially they reduce the value of the surrounding properties. They decided to do it because they wanted to be people more aware of their surroundings, uh, to be more even interested in the history of objects and appreciate them more. And uh, even the fight against the purposeful um, destructions of the buildings. Uh, the nice thing is uh, that the, the, the authors decided to make something, uh, something more than only the portal. And for some buildings, especially those uh, with the with the history of um, with some interesting historical or cultural background, they even organized the tours for the citizens. As, uh, of course, with the with the cooperation with the um, with the owners of the houses or the or their local uh, authorities. Uh, another uh, example, it's called the uh, map of educational failure or success. As you can see in the Czech, it's a uh, it's more clever name than in, a, in a English. And again, just to let clear, I'm using this kind of maybe simple map visualization as the use cases. But in every case, I decided to put in this presentation, uh, the map visualization is only the instrument to draw the attention um, to really important social or economic or, or governmental phenomena and to make it more easier to understand the relations between diver different issues they are putting in, in the map. It's usually only the part of the portal that is taking care of, the, of this problem. In this case, uh, the authors uh, are decided to put in one map uh, the data from the, uh, the economic data, a social data and educational data and decided to let clear uh, the huge inequalities uh, at the level of education between regions in the Czech Republic. They're trying to answer to the questions how is a student's educational failure related to the social situation or founding of schools in the regions, what are the strengths uh, and weakness uh, in the education, etc., etc., just to better understand the relations between these different phenomena. What is really important in this uh, in this case, um, it's that the authors uh, that it, it, it's a group of social scientists and data analysts, and uh, they became thanks to their work. That is not the only product of, of, of these uh, authors, and thanks to that work, especially with the media and social media, some of them became even the part of the government advisory bodies. So they have this possibility to draw attention uh, to these problems, even from the part of the, uh, of the politically important person and to change a little bit the political reality in the area they're focused on. 
uh, when I was thinking about the use cases from the environmental impact, it was quite difficult for me because we have we have really really a lot of examples of the open data reuse in this uh, category, and I decided to choose uh, two two examples: one big one and one small one. Uh, the first one is a portal called Envy Data. Uh, it's uh, it's amazing work of one ex public official from uh, I don't know if it's ex, but he, he was working for sure for Czech uh, Hydrometeorological Institute, and uh, he, so his data analysts and uh, his scientists from the field, and he uses data about uh, environment and climate change to make analysis uh, uh, of, of this data, to provide the public with environmental data in a clear, comprehensive and uh, interactive form that captures and teaches. As I already said, there's a, a huge advantage that he knows how does it work in the, in the public organization that are working in, with the environmental data and the climate change data. He's really, really great with the work with media and you can find it even on social media. He uses his account at, uh, it was Twitter, now it's X, the, 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 the platform. But he uses uh, this uh, infographics, this visual, visualization um, during his presentation in the media and social media and draws the attention and really, really explains what's going on and what can happen in the future uh, in, the, in the topics of climate change. And another, uh, Example, it's called Komsnim. Uh, I don't know how to how to translate it. If it's you know, where to put it or where to take it, but it's uh, it, I think it's a result of one of the hackathons that uh, happened. Or they were organized like two or three years ago, but it's still working because it's really used uh, by a massive amount of people in the Czech Republic, and it's basically a, a web application of map application. Uh, of the places where citizens get legally and uh, in most cases for free get rid of unwanted things and waste. It was created uh, because they wanted to, the authors wanted to help to reduce the amount of waste uh, that ends up in plant field and especially in the black dams in the in the nature. Uh, as you can see uh, in the right uh, right part of the presentation, you can just. Uh, just find a place near your area, near the area where you live or where the state at the moment. You can see uh, the place where you could get rid of the waste. What kind of waste? That is really, really important because you cannot put in the same place uh, the oil, the electric batteries, or I don't know, the, the old furniture. Uh, and uh, sometimes even there's a website uh, where it's monitoring if the place is full or not, or if it's the biggest play, bigger place, you can see if it's open at the time or not. So you can contact them. That is really, really useful. And it contains a total over 110,000 waste collection points only in the Czech Republic. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we have a category of economic impact. Uh, here I decided to choose only, only one example because, I, and I think Natalia already said it, it's quite difficult to find something uh, where you can really see the impact, of, the economic impact uh, of the of the open data and uh, in this case we have uh, i think it's on the on the frontier between the social impact and the economic impact it's called unemployment map and i decided to choose this one example for one reason maybe you, you know that unemployment rate in czech republic is for for quite a long period really really low in 2020 it was something like 3.5 percent or something like that and since it, uh, be, uh, it's been uh, low for a long time, it's usually, it's, it's not a it's problem for majority, so it usually just leads to neglecting the problem uh, of the group that are affected uh, by this low rate of uh, unemployment. So the authors of this uh, portal or map visualization, but it's accompanied by different hypotheses that are dealing with the problems uh, related to the unemployment. Uh, they are trying to visualize this data and highlight the changes over the time. And for example, they were trying to find an answer for various uh, analysis, like the influence of COVID-19 on precarious workers or the impact of legislative changes, changes sorry, 
on social benefit payments or how low employment changes the situation of households uh, with the children in, in material need. Uh, that was all what did uh, when we take uh, when we when we talk about the real reuse cases uh, so uh, just to sum it up a little bit more about uh, how we find the reuse ex examples i think it was the questions from the italy that uh, because the situation in Czech republic is the same uh, the open data are uh, disponible for free there's nothing like a registration we have even the problem with the monitoring of the activity of the users of the portal and the catalogs. Mostly, um, most public organizations have their own local open data catalog and the national catalog is only like the first point of contact and then they're using the local catalog. So for our uh, team, it's quite dif difficult to, to know our users uh, very well. So we're trying to find uh, different uh, ways to understand what are the reuse, the reuse, open data reuse examples in the Czech Republic. I don't know if it's called in English, uh, it's donkey work, really. It's time, really time consuming. It's really, you have to Google a lot, uh, but at the end uh, you can see the results as uh, our, I don't know how it happened. It's quite a miracle, the, the first position in the open data uh, maturity report uh, in the impact area. So how we find the examples? We are supporting hackathons. Uh, I think their role quite changed uh, in the society in the in the several years. At the beginning, it was, it was most uh, to draw attention to the open data. Now it's to support the, the creation of the reuse examples. Then we monitor the results of open data competitions. That is very, very important because when there's something like award for the authors, they're really willing to, to share their name, to share the impact of the application that is based on open data. We do media monitoring. Uh, that is really helpful for uh, uh, the examples of data journalism. Uh, and uh, then we try to have direct contact with open data users. I'm quite fortunate in this because I have an NGO background and civic tech community background. Uh, I was working in the area before I came to Ministry of Interior and Digital and Information Agency and the Czech Republic is not so big. So we are we have quite good relations as an open data community. So in some cases, it's uh, quite good to, to know who's the user of the open data. Then we try to communicate the use cases. We try to communicate it during conferences, during webinar, as th this one, or during even um, uh, we are using it during our uh, trainings and e-learnings, uh, just to make public and even public official to better understand the value of the open data and why are we doing all this around the open data. And we are using the list of the open data uh, reuse cases and the annual report. That it's maybe uh, it seems quite boring, but it's very popular usually uh, between the the public organization because it's very complex. It's not only because of reuses, but uh, for us, it's really important to put it in there. And finally, uh, and I'm really really glad to say it that the, we have a pro we launched this year a project to uh, develop a note of open data portal a little bit more and we finally are going to be able to put the reuse examples uh, in the portal uh, directly and to link them with the specific data set they are based on and even we are going to add the possibility to report the reuse examples so i hope it's going to be uh, it's going to be uh, more easier to answer the questions in the open data maturity report so thank you very much uh, for attending. So we have several questions and Flora, I don't know if I should answer them now or I'm going to answer them during the Q&A session. However you like, we will have the Q&A session. If you want it, you can go through them and I will address them to you during the session. If it's, uh, however it is preferable to you. Okay, do we have some time before this has been take place or? We, I, yes, 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 we, we will have some time uh, for this. So you can, I have already uh, collected your questions, so, so no worries about it. Okay, so maybe I can, I can ask for some of them. Uh, somebody, yes. will, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, we will take care of these. You can answer, we will take uh, whatever you have answered, we will not take it on in the end of the QA session. Uh, okay, so the measurement, I've already said it. Somebody was, uh, had a questions. We will, uh, share, we will share them with you, Lenka, no worries about okay. them separately. 
Okay, Perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much for setting your insights on 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 how the uh, Republic is working on open data and all the initiatives. Uh, now we will give the floor to uh, Josephine. Uh, Josephine will share with us uh, all the best practices coming from Sweden on the impact dimension. So, Josephine, the floor is yours. Thanks. Maybe not all the best practices. <laughs> that would take some time. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Josephine Lassinanti, uh, and I work at DIG, which is the Swedish Digitalization uh, Agency. I've been working there for about three years now. And before that, I also did some research on open data with a focus on, on reuse, because it's really interesting. Uh, so I'm going to share with you some, yeah, here I am. And if you want to contact me, here's my uh, address. I live actually up north uh, in, Lul in Luleå. It's called it at the, um, at the top of the Botnik Sea. So, so we have winter up here right now. So I use go by train a lot because in at DIG we work, uh, DIG has personnel around all Sweden. So we're uh, working at a distance, most of us. So, but open data impacts in Sweden. Uh, right. Uh, I'm just going to talk first about uh, what made us improve in the impact dimension. And it was, uh, it was mostly because of two things that happened in 2021 and 2022. First, in 2021, uh, the government launched a Swedish data strategy, uh, which uh, got quite, uh, it really impacted people and it, it's uh, turned into a lot of discussions. And what what was really important is that the government assigned, uh, they put out five big assignments to various agencies, national agencies, uh, in the areas of life science, statistics, uh, sustainable development, transport and mobility and skills. So uh, that led to the work with Open Data started also uh, in a number of areas, for example, in life science, they assigned the National eHealth Agency to, to create a national data space for imaging diagnostics. And um, for sustainable development, they assigned the Swedish Space Agency with the task to improve their space data lab and also to uh, find ways to increase the use of satellite data for for example, agriculture. And uh, another for transport and mobility area, uh, they assigned the Swedish, it's a research institute for transport, the road and transport uh, research institute with uh, finding ways to use, improve the use of data uh, for uh, building charging infrastructure in Sweden. Uh, and that has led to, to much work throughout the public sector, which has involved lots of actors. Uh, so the aim is to optimize the planning and development of this national loading and uh, charging infrastructure. And it's both for, for electrical cars and for hydrogen. And uh, in the skills, area the government assigned uh, the Swedish public employment service uh, with a task to build a national data infrastructure related to you know labor market employment uh, with the aim of increasing um, uh, competence uh, you know the flow of competence and resources and also lifelong learning so these were five also statistics uh, statistics Sweden has got an assignment to work on smart statistics and also to launch uh, like a policy or rule for other statistics agencies that all public uh, statistics should be uh, in open data and that will start in 2024 actually. So these, this data strategy actually had a lot of impact on, on uh, like the broader work on open data in Sweden. 
in these five areas. And uh, the common ground for that is that to improve that data as really seen as a strategic resource. Um, and I don't think we have really seen the impacts of these assignments yet, because they are like in a couple of years. So we're waiting for that. Um, also, in 2022, uh, the government launched a new Swedish uh, open data law or data law uh, and with a quite open process. And that process uh, engaged a lot of uh, people. They had open dialogues and hearings. And um, they had, uh, uh, what do you call it, when <laughs> you send out to different organizations and they could have um, their take on it and send in their comments. So it was quite a, a, um, a um, co-working uh, process. And I think that was a really good thing because it also meant that a lot of people got aware of open data uh, through this process. Um, so that was a really good thing and we can also see the impacts of that now because we, we can really see that a lot of people have gained uh, increased awareness of the fact uh, or, or of open data and, and the potential for it. So that was really good. Um, the strategic awareness. Um, we also see that in Sweden we have, uh, I put that as a first because I think we couldn't have done this without uh, the crowd driven engagement that we have in Sweden. There are loads of people that actually are really engaged in this question and they, they, um, they provide knowledge and also questions at our community at the Swedish data portal. And they also lobby the question of open data in their own organizations and they forward everything we do. So I think um, I think they deserve a great deal of credit for, for, the, for the way things uh, improve in Sweden. Um, and also uh, by now we have a pretty good uh, platform uh, for support and guidance. There are room for improvements always, of course, but I think we have a good basic uh, ground to stand on, uh, which, so we have, for example, recommendations for the open data sharing process, for API development, for open licenses, and also quite recently, um, we launched recommendations for procurement of data uh, aiming to, you know, make it easier for public organization to actually make it right from the beginning so that they can get it data that can later be shared as open data and also be used and, you know, uh, work towards improved interoperability. Um, so I think we have a pretty good platform and we also see that uh, a number of public actors uh, think this is a really good thing because then they know what to look for and they share it with others. And also, which is something new, which is not part of the <laughs> Open Data Majority 2022, but we also launched an Open Data Ambassador Program, which is a, a some sort of a digital do-it-yourself uh, program, which we, we have a concept we call Train the Trainer, uh, which is connected to that we have a lot of people that are really, you know, this crowd that are engaged in these questions. So we saw a potential here that uh, we could uh, educate ambassadors for this course. Uh, and it's, a, it's only available for public actors at the moment. Uh, and what we also do is that we, we give them PowerPoints, just basic PowerPoints that on like what is open data, what is interoperability, what does the process look like, the basic of the open data law, uh, so they can study for themselves and then they can use the material uh, as a inspiration or if they use it as is. And today we have uh, nine participants from 94 public organizations 
And what is really, really interesting and fun, I think, is that we have uh, almost like the gender statistics on this is that we have 55% men and 45% women in this program. And I think that's, that's terrific. Um, it's just where we want to be. Um, right, measuring reuse, as I think you all uh, agree on that it's it's quite challenging and uh, it's still a lot of manual detective work and uh, we often feel that we don't have the time or the resources to do it properly and so you need a lot of friends and um, we get a lot of tips so uh, and we google and we but it is difficult and we are working at the moment to, to create a better space at the data portal for um, showcasing these, uh, these uh, reuse cases. But we also do uh, some basic you know, web statistics and we um, also use, uh, we have defined user profiles that we are uh, use we use in dialogues to see yeah. and we don't have user profiles you know based on roles such as developers journalists researchers because we see that for example uh, development of digital services is not only uh, done by you know within the civic tech or uh, or by traditional developers so we have uh, formed four different um, groups of users, which is based more on their motivation to use open data. And these are, uh, the first is information driven users. That, that can be uh, different people that want to use information or open data as to gain information and knowledge. And we see here a lot of uh, citizens, researchers, also other public sector organizations, you know, you want, uh, we see here potentially are also in at universities, for example, for teachers. And then we have maybe the most common group is development driven users. Uh, there is the want to use open data for digital services, for AI, machine learning, and other uh, uh, technical development. And the third group is what we call analytically driven uh, researchers, no, sorry, <laughs> users, but they are, uh, many of them are researchers, they use uh, data for analytics, um, but that can also be business analytics, for example, in uh, different kinds of organizations. And the, third, the fourth is uh, we call organizational improvement driven uh, users, which is more related to using open data for efficiency reasons for, and, uh, and here we have a lot of public sector employees, sorry. Um, and apart from that, we also have uh, somewhat generic areas for impact that we use as a discussion materials. For example, we highlight that, you know, it can be digital services, it can be improved research, you know, AI is a big uh, area, but also crisis management and uh, democracy and transparency. So, so we try more to use it as a basis for dialogue to better understand and categorize what's happening in the, in the impact areas. But uh, there's still uh, lots of things that we could do better if we sort of had more resources. Basically, we don't, um, it takes time and it's quite difficult. So it's, um, uh, we have also looked into more automatic uh, ways of uh, gathering, uh, you know, download statistics, uh, calls for APIs and such, but it's still, we haven't, we have looked at it, but we haven't done anything more yet, since it's to be, it's a bit technically tricky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I've got four, <laughs> four, uh, use cases, one for each impact area. Um, but we, of course, have more, but I chose uh, four different, I hope. Yeah, 
Uh, and the first one uh, is within governmental area is a, a, a company, a Swedish organization called uh, Svensk Ambulans Flyg, like uh, Swedish Ambulance Flights. And uh, it's an organization that is owned by all 21 regions in Sweden, and they coordinate all ambulance flight throughout the country. And uh, they use a Norwegian service. Uh, <laughs> I saw that the, the representatives from Norway was here. So um, they use a Norwegian service uh, for this uh, for, for the planning. And that Norwegian service uses the Swedish open data uh, from our Swedish weather agency. So you can see this is a quite uh, cross-border service, which I think is quite interesting. And the open data here facilitates the safe the safe planning uh, or planning of safe transports because you don't you can't fly when it's for example too windy or if you can't land because of snow for example uh, and but we also have another uh, example which i don't have a slide on but uh, in 2018 uh, we had an election um, in sweden uh, or and our national election agency, uh, there, during the counting of the election or of the results, their website went down. Uh, it was sort of like uh, really uh, an incident, uh, which was, you know, not good, uh, since that's their main mission to, to report on the elections. Uh, but then they had the election data as open data, which resulted in that uh, the election result could still be um, accessed and visualized in, for example, magazines, by journalists, and other web pages that used that open data. I think that was also a really interesting example of how open data can actually create redundancy. And, uh, for example, in this case, elections. So I used to say that it's like uh, if you have a restaurant and the restaurant get, needs to close, but the kitchen is still open, so you can you can deliver takeaway food. <laughs> I don't know if you uh, understood that. Um, if it was yeah. Um, next uh, in the social area, uh, I chose to show this uh, carpooling. Uh, service. Uh, it's an organization called Schussgruppen. It's like uh, the ride group in English. They're on Facebook and um, and they work to uh, to increase the number of people that uh, share their rights with others. And uh, you need to. And their focus is on on uh, they make um, uh, deals with big member organizations so as a, if you're a private person it's more difficult to use the service but they make a deal with for example there's a swedish society for nature conservation which has about 300,000 members in sweden and then they offer the services to these members as a as a, as a member service so uh, and they and they say this this is because uh, carpooling is based on a lot of trust you need to sort of trust the people you ride with um, and also which is really interesting um, and it's based on a lot of on open geodata of course uh, and what's also interesting about this case is that they also collect their own data on carpooling and share this as open data with, uh, for example, municipalities or regions uh, to support their city and transport planning, because they wanted to also work more strategically. Mm -hmm. And uh, for environmental, I chose this. Uh, <laughs> it's a mobile game, which is, I think this is a really cool game. It's like a Pokemon, but for the biodiversity. So you can use this game, you go out in the nature and then you can identify and tag different uh, animals, bugs, uh, plants, mushrooms, yeah. 
Uh, and this app is based on open data from the Swedish Species Information Center. And uh, so they create a lot of learning. And I know that a lot of kids use this because I think it's really interesting. And then they can say, okay, what is this plant? Uh, what's this um, bag called? And they, uh, they learn. But what it also does is that they log uh, data about uh, how much, you know, where you can identify these plants. And then uh, the service is also, uh, it adds, um, it transfers the logged data in, in the app back to the original database at the Swedish Species Information Center. So you have also here a crowdsourced <laughs> data process, which I think is very interesting. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it, it's, quite beneficial, I think, and then it's gained a lot of attraction here. And the last uh, in the economic area is a, uh, a company that has launched a digital mar marketplace for the trade of grains, um, where they can connect buyers and sellers and provide different services related to prognosis, analysis, and uh, predicting uh, cost or, or the, the cost of grains. And they use open data from several Swedish authorities to enable uh, this analysis and prognosis. For example, the Swedish Agriculture Agency, the weather forecast, or the Swedish weather, um, the weather agency, I think also statistics. Um, and a fun thing that they also <laughs> did that they enabled uh, increased traceability of grains. I'm sorry, this little picture there, there's a beer bottle. So what they did is that they enabled uh, data uh, about grains to be traced so that you can see that, okay, this beer bottle, the, the ingredients was, uh, comes from this district in Sweden, this exact bottle. Uh, and that was, I think, this is quite a cool thing, I think. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how much is used today, but they, at least they did, uh, uh, there was some example of it. Uh, so what to do next? Um, we still see a huge need of communicating on how uh, to work with open data and why. And especially uh, the why is closely connected to the management level. They need to know why. And uh, we see that more people are engaged and understand the, the benefits of open data at the like, more operational level. Uh, but management still asks, why should we do this? Um, what are the benefits? So we, we we need to work on that more. And that also is related to us at lobby politicians on impacts, because that's, uh, we can see that uh, in Sweden is still, uh, still quite a low awareness of uh, the different uh, impacts, uh, for example, economics and uh, you know all the different uh, impacts uh, that can happen. So, I think we also need to work on, on that level to really raise the awareness. Uh, we are uh, working today uh, on some sort of, not educational initiative, but more support for uh, the management level, the strategic level that uh, is focused on uh, talking about why is this important for, for Sweden and how why is data a strategic resource? And uh, we're also working currently with um, both collect and the show reuse cases, for example, with improvements on the data portal. Uh, and here we see that it's necessary for us to find ways to make, uh, you know, the crowd I've been talking to, the, all the engaged people, that they can actually. Uh, write re reuse cases also themselves and you know publish in our data portal because uh, we don't really have the time to 
to do all that by ourselves. And we also don't know all the reuse cases that exist. Um, so this is, uh, the idea here is to also uh, empower uh, this crowd sharing of reuse cases. And we also need to go further on investigating different automatic measurements on how to, to understand reuse. Um, starting with maybe measuring download, but that is not equal to actual reuse, but it, it's, we see that it's, a, it's an important step in understanding what data is interesting and used and which is not. So, and uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. And um, I can share some links with you later if, if uh, yeah, in the slides when it's sent out. I think right. sharing the links. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Josephine. And definitely you can share the links uh, with us and yeah. we'll link them in the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, I have already seen questions going on, people answering uh, all okay. around. Um, here is also the link to where to contact Josephine. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. And now I'm going to go, I think, directly to the Q&A session. I would like maybe also Natalia, Lenka to uh, open their cameras so we can start uh, answering uh, some of uh, of the questions uh, received, uh, I already have seen that Natalia, that you have answered the majority of questions from your side. Maybe it will be nice, uh, will worth sharing uh, uh, the question regarding when we should expect the next open data maturity uh, mm -hmm. report in 2023 and what we should expect. Uh, Natalia, you're on mute. So the report is in preparation and it will come mid-December, uh, really mid-December. We will, of yeah. course, announce it on our channels, so you, you won't have a chance to miss it. Uh, yeah, we expect the deep dive into 2023 with uh, more information on high-value data sets. Uh, we put the focus uh, on it because the um, implementing regulation is ongoing and countries are implementing. Um, I don't have many spoilers uh, now because I still didn't see the report. <laughs> but uh, I'm also curious, yeah. No worries, no worries. And I think we, we should recommend also to everyone to stay tuned to our social media and newsletter so they will get uh, information once uh, we have the report ready and the report is ready to be out. Uh, but thank you so much, uh, Natalia, for this. Then I will go um, uh, to Lenka for um, one of the questions received. Uh, it's quite specific, so uh, it is what is average yearly uptime for general API of check open data? I send the questions to our colleague uh, who is taking care of the portal during the of presentation and he said mm -hmm. the answer is 99.5%. I don't know what does it mean exactly, but that's the answer to your questions, Rose. Uh, and if you are asking about the local uh, open data FA of the API from the different providers, I don't know the numbers there. But we don't have really much compliance from the point of the user, so it's going to be okay, probably. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you for answering this. Um, then a question for for Josephine. Uh, you measured mm -hmm. the automatic uh, measures that uh, are going to be parts of the next steps. Can you maybe share what kind of automatic measures are you uh, planning to have? Well, planning. Uh, we have made. <laughs> Uh, some uh, investigations into what, how could we actually do it, but we haven't started because we still need to find money to do it. Uh, but uh, for example, how could we, how could we get access of downloads statistics from, from, for example, both APIs, but also data shared in other formats? I mean, if we only take APIs, we don't get those that you know download an Excel file, for example. Okay. So, and we looked into various uh, 
solutions relating to you know should should we should we ask them to you know build uh, apis with just download statistics that we could you know access but since um, there are also legal challenges since not not legal but you know policy and they need to know that they can share that data with us uh, mm -hmm. because it's 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 not our apis it's other organizations mm -hmm. and i think one issue was that it it contained uh, personal uh, data in form of a ip no, ip numbers for example mm -hmm. so th there were some challenges it's not that easy and like should we have like one api for mm. <laughs> for i mean some organizations have 4000 data sets uh, should we require them to make like one api that we can access but we still have like 700 uh, public organizations in sweden so I, I think it's quite a difficult uh, but we we're looking into it to see and also we, we have we can be more automatic in what we can actually measure at our own uh, data portal, of course. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much, Josephine, for your answer. Then mm -hmm. I will go up to Lenka uh, because we received also some uh, questions uh, regarding the contracts watchdog that you shared with us. I think some of them they have been answered throughout your presentation, but maybe you can summarize uh, uh, a bit. Oh, what is the scope of the contracts watchdog and does it provide national and international data? No, it's only national data because the register of contracts, it's uh, based on only on national contracts. So unfortunately not, okay. not international. Uh, there is also another question. I think it's related on, of, on the map of execution example that you shared, that the question has to do with, would you clarify execution? In this. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't sure how to translate it. We don't have that penalty. We don't execute people on the street here. Right? <laughs> uh, it's something like uh, uh, repayment of your debts that is reinforced by court. That the court is saying to you that you should pay your debts. Okay, when you're paying for TV, not with your own money, but you're taking some money from some. Usually, it's a company that it's like two. 200 percent plus you're going to pay at the end and you have a problem to repay it at the end is the court who's saying it that you should uh, repay it at the end they're going to take your estate right and we have this problem because uh, at, at one point we have like four millions of executions in the czech republics and there's like 10 millions of us in the whole country so it was it, it was there were even the children inside when we uh, like opened the data it was obvious that something's wrong with the system when something like that happened so it's uh, a repayment of your debt that the court is saying that you should do i see well, thank you for sharing this and for clarifying uh, this point i think there's also another one that we have on the debt data on the empty are the data on empty houses open mm. and do owners agree to share their data or is it based on a law and also, is there no data protection issue in this case? Yeah, the data, uh, this database is based on open data, the, only on the publicly available data that can be open. The, it's basically data from the cadastro when you have the, who's the owner of the property and what's the address. But the photographs are usually added to dead houses that are or, uh, owned by the public or by the local authority or the city or the state. Uh, and usually it's in terrible, terrible state, so it can be really dangerous for the surroundings or with the, with the agreement of the owner. That happens usually when we, when we have more owner and they are not able to, to talk with each other and r resolve the problem of the, of the house. It's not like that you're going for a vacation for the two weeks and somebody is going to put your apartment as an empty house on the, <laughs> yeah. on the database. Just to be <laughs> Oh. I see, I see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, then we have one question. I think it's applicable for to both of you. Uh, maybe, Josephine, you can start first. Uh, what is the profile actually of the users that you have? Um, I, I mean, we, we see that we have, we can, we, we can look at profile as roles, for example, and we see, you know, developers, researchers, journalists, and also increasingly more important, the public sector itself uh, as users. 
but also then we, we did this um, uh, grouping of based on motives because we also needed to understand why why do they want to use open data and for what reasons for getting information for developing things uh, to analyze i mean and also to to work towards efficiency and improvements of uh, an organization in different ways and you know these overlap of course because you know if you improve your organization you can do that by using ai or making services or uh, share uh, information um and i think that has been helpful for us in dialogues because it also uh, makes it more clear for what reasons of why you can use what you can use data for and it sort of broadens the the discussions a bit mm. thank you thank you josephine uh same question for you langa what is normally the profile of the users that you have uh, as you can see during my presentation it's usually from the ngo sectors there's different civic activists from the environmental topic agenda from the social social phenomena there's really uh, there are a lot of social scientists and so on we don't have so much awareness about the private companies using open data we have some uh, cases in the open data maturity report uh, 23 so let's see maybe next year i'm going to say mm. the name uh, but uh, usually it's it's NGO. And then we have several uh, uh, users from the point of view from the public organization. And that's, that's really good. We are really happy for it. Yeah. Uh, I see, yeah, ma'am, I did the answer, answer the question right. But I think we have, in Sweden, we have um, uh, a lot of reuse in the private sector. Mm -hmm. But also we can see that in research, for example, uh, I, we have an example where researchers use satellite data to 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 question how much uh, the forest has been or you know deforestation like how how many trees have actually been cut down so they use satellite data to to go back through the years and see okay this is actually how much uh, trees <laughs> disappeared <laughs> in the forests uh, to to question like public figures numbers of another so, so to create a debate mm -hmm. uh, for example uh, we, we, we would like the public sector to see themselves more as open data users not just as open data providers because we think also that is a key to getting more data out uh, that they see themselves as, as uh, really important actors in in the usage Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, all three of you. Um, I think we don't have further questions. And seeing at the time we do have two more minutes on the Q&A session, I will have just a last question for all of you, more theoretical, yeah, is how, for you, what would be important, the important steps or actions so you can continue improving on the impact and the reuse of open data? Um, I don't know either Josephine or Lenka who would like to go first. Um, I think we work uh, a lot to to try to um, empower broad and big um, uh, initiatives that are that works towards interoperability, for example, within statistics, so that we don't just get one actor that so that we get like all actors within that sector to to work together towards data specifications and so that we uh, so that we can sort of get data from like whole of sweden not just uh, different parts of sweden because that we really feel that that would uh, increase the potential for also for impacts because then you can do a lot more if you have like for example if you have the same data from all municipalities and we have 290 municipalities that would make a huge difference compared to if we have data from 35 municipalities um, thank you thank you Jonathan, for this lenka uh from your side uh what would be the steps actions that you foresee for continuously improving 
Yeah, regarding the municipalities, we have the same problem as Josephine. We have more yeah. than 6,000 of them, so it's quite difficult. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the structure is it's, it's really complicated in Czech Republic, the local structure. Mm. But uh, I think we need to more focus on the data quality, because with better data quality, we're going to have more users, especially from the private sector. And then uh, I really hope that uh, by the development of the portal, by the possibility that the users or the, the public is going to inform us about the uh, reuse cases and the possible impact of the own data in the society, mm -hmm. we are going to get more in touch with, uh, with the authors of, of more uh, examples. So mm -hmm. I hope it's going to be better next year. Thank you. Perfect. We, we hope so. We're sure about it. So thanks. Thanks, uh, all of you. I see the time so we can actually move in the end of, uh, of our session. And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, please provide uh, your feedback. It takes three minutes of your time. You can scan the QR codes that you see right now on the screen, or you can actually access the link that we have shared now in, in the chat. So I'll give you a few more time to go through this. Uh, in the meantime, we are going to have further activities, further webinars uh, taking place under the Academy. Uh, stay tuned because we are going to have in the upcoming uh, few weeks a webinar on the data ownership. What is your data? We will have dates, uh, the dates soon and we will share it with you. So in order to know more about these events, we encourage you to follow us on social media um as well as subscribe to our newsletter to stay up to date with all our updates and i will close the session by leaving this uh um this light uh, on the QR code i would like to thank our speakers for today uh natalia lenka josephin was so nice to have you and share your insights it, it was really really interesting and i think also our audience I uh, enjoyed it a lot. Thanks to all of you that joined today and also thanks to all the speakers and everyone that contributed to this series. So thanks a lot and see you all to another Data Europa Academy webinar. Thank you.